Hey everybody, welcome to Talking Scripture, a podcast where we illustrate relevance and application of the scriptures in Come Follow Me. We also dive into the history and cultures of the text. Thanks for taking the time to share and subscribe to this podcast. For show notes, head over to our website, TalkingScripture.org. Welcome to Talking Scripture. I'm Mike. And I'm Bryce. And today we're going to be in Matthew 11 and 12 and Luke chapter 11. Now again, we're kind of following Luke. That's our backbone. So we're going to do this in Luke's order. We're going to skip a couple things that we've already covered or we'll cover better, but we're going to talk about Jesus casting out devils and the Pharisees accusing him of casting them out by the power of the devil. They'll talk about hypocrisy and Jesus responds, hey, your fathers killed the prophets. And then we're going to move on to his comment that it'll be more tolerable for outside of Israel cities than for those who had the light and chose not to follow it, because you're rejecting such a great light. That's an interesting truth that he's going to talk about. And then Jesus will invite us to take his yoke upon us because his burden is light. And we're going to talk about the Sabbath day. Jesus will talk about what is lawful to do on the Sabbath day. Then we're going to see the Pharisees take counsel to try and kill Christ because they are offended by him. He will respond by talking about blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, and at the very end we'll talk about Jesus giving signs. What is the doctrine of asking for a sign? So that's kind of a brief summary. We're just going to follow Luke and then jump back into Matthew and do Matthew 11 and 12. Okay, Luke 11, 1 through 13 discusses the Lord's Prayer, and Bryce and I already kind of covered that with the Sermon on the Mount. And so from that, we transition to Luke eleven fourteen through 36, and this is also contained in the narrative of Matthew 12, 22 through 30, and Mark 3, 19 through 27. This is where Jesus is being accused of casting out devils by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. So I'm going to start with Matthew 12, verse 22. Then was brought up unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself, how shall then his kingdom stand? And if I, by Beelzebub, cast out devils, By whom do your children cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. Now, that's a pretty interesting question that he's asking them here. I really see this as Jesus using their own logic against them. I mean, essentially, Jesus' question puts the Pharisees in a really tough predicament. I'm going to read my translation of Matthew 12, 27. And if I, in the power of Beelzebub, cast out demons, then by who do your children cast out the demons? So through this logic, they will be your judges. It's kind of like the question he asks them when he says, the baptism of John, was it from heaven or was it of men? Now that's Luke 20 verse 4. In other words, any answer that they give Jesus would completely wreck them in this exchange. You see, their children, the children of the Jews or their followers, are other followers of the Jews, and they were performing similar miracles, and they were performing healings of people that were possessed of evil spirits. And they were therefore more powerful than these Pharisees that are accusing Jesus. And so his logic is essentially this. If these healings were done by the power of Satan, then Satan would have more power than the Pharisees, and they would become subject to him. Again, what he's doing is he's catching them in their faulty reasoning. This is Kent Jackson's commentary on this. He says, On the other hand, if Jesus had cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come to the Pharisees, and they were rejecting it or fighting against it. So Jesus declared by what power these others were performing these miracles— We read this in the Joe Smith translation. They also cast out devils by the Spirit of God, for unto them is given the power over devils that they might cast them out. That's the Joe Smith translation. These others, members of the church of Jesus Christ who held priesthood power, were not using the power of Satan, 
but they were using the power of God, delegated to them as members of the kingdom. The kingdom was restored, and the Pharisees were fighting against it. That commentary by Kent Jackson is really interesting, because essentially Jesus is putting them in an untenable position. If your followers are casting them out, then they're going to be your judges, because you guys can't cast them out. And if it was Satan casting out Satan, then his kingdom's divided, and that doesn't make any logical sense. And so the, the Savior is essentially saying, if I'm casting out devils by the Spirit, which is his proclamation, then the kingdom of God has come unto you, or it is among us. And Jesus is constantly having to grapple with their arguments because of their tradition. And so this is one of the themes that we're going to see in this set of texts, but we'll see it in other texts as well, where Jesus is kind of butting up against tradition, and sometimes tradition can stand in the way of us learning truth. Can I give a modern application So they want to destroy Jesus, and their reasoning doesn't hold water. Well, sometimes we do the same thing with the Bible and the Book of Mormon. People want to reject the Book of Mormon because it means they need to change and accept the restoration. So they want to reject the Book of Mormon. So they claim, well, the Book of Mormon's false because it doesn't agree with the Bible. And yet, it leads men to do good. It leads men to the very God that the Bible is trying to lead men to come to understand. And therein is the twist. That's what they can't reconcile. They want to reject the Book of Mormon as evil, as bad, as from the devil. And yet the book does good. It leads men to do good. Even a casual reading of the Book of Mormon will clearly show you its invitation is for you to better your life, to be more kind and more loving and serve your fellow men. So how can a book whose main objective is to help you to draw closer to God and to love your fellow men and to be better be an evil book? It's the same idea that we have today in our society. And so Nephi, I think, caught that. At the very end of his writings, he says, And now, my beloved brethren, and also Jew, and all ye ends of the earth, hearken unto these words and believe in Christ. And if you believe not in these words, believe in Christ. And then this powerful declaration. And if you shall believe in Christ... You shall believe in these words, for they are the words of Christ, and he hath given them unto me, and they teach all men that they should do good. It's kind of the same situation of Jesus being accused of casting out devils by Beelzebub. Wait a minute, how can you claim that a book is evil? When from page one to the very last page, its whole motive is to get you to do good and to be righteous and to live more like Christ. So let's judge the Book of Mormon by what it tells us to do and not necessarily by the same traditions that was perhaps causing the Pharisees to reject the Savior's casting out of devils. Yes, excellent. After this exchange, Luke eleven thirty seven through 54 is an exchange between Jesus and the scribes and the Pharisees and the lawyers, and he rebukes them for hypocrisy. Now, this confrontation is really kind of coming out of verse 37 and 38. It seems to me, as I read this, that when Jesus sits down in this Pharisee's house to eat, that this Pharisee is inviting him into his home. And I think, I don't know, but I think that perhaps this is kind of an olive branch that by inviting him in, maybe we're going to come to some kind of an agreement. And I read this as Jesus is declaring himself as an outsider to their tradition, because it says that the Pharisee marveled in verse 38, that Jesus had not first washed before dinner. Uh, One commentator, Joel Green, notes that when Jesus does this, when he comes to this man's house, this Pharisee, and he doesn't wash that Jesus, in one way, this can be read as Jesus snubbing his host by failing to wash before the meal because of their tradition. It could be read that way. Now, hand washing before a meal was not an issue of physical, but of ritual cleanliness, and it was not an Old Testament requirement, but it was tradition. And so by him not doing this, 
in one way, it would be seen as Jesus marking himself as an outsider. Now, I know we talked earlier about Jesus worked not to offend people, but there were times when Jesus took an opportunity with his behavior or his words to invite people to ask him questions, to kind of push against their boundaries and their tradition to help them feel or to think in different ways. Now, this is rough. The the language Jesus is going to use in Luke 11 is pretty tough. It's hard to overlook this because he does castigate them in verse 39. He calls them fools in verse 40. And then he talks about the hypocrisy of the Pharisees in verse 42 and 43 and 44, and he goes on and on. And I think, you know, it's worthy to read. I I would highly encourage you, read the text. We're not going to cover all of it. The main point I want to hone in on is this interesting verse in verse 47. So we're in Luke 11, verse 47. The Savior says, Woe unto you, for you build the sepulchers of the prophets, and your fathers killed them. Now, what were the prophets that the house of Israel killed? And so I'm going to kind of delve into historical tradition and also the Book of Mormon. This stuff's all in the show notes, so it's all in there. But just note that Isaiah was traditionally sawn in half by King Manasseh. Now, King Manasseh was Isaiah's father-in-law, and according to tradition, Isaiah is sawn in half by this king. So Jesus may be referring to Isaiah. Another option, now this is not in the Bible, but it's kind of hinted at in the Bible, that's the story of Jeremiah. If you remember when we talked about Jeremiah, or just go back and read Jeremiah chapter 38, he's thrown into a cistern. Now that's because some of his prophecies didn't jive with what their expectations were. And so the Bible, although it doesn't give a specific account of his death, It does describe the persecution and the difficulties he faced during his life. Many people refer to him as the weeping prophet because of the messages that he portrayed and the fact that he was constantly harassed and he was thrown in a dungeon. Now, according to tradition, he goes with a group of exiles to Egypt after the temple is destroyed in 586 BC. And according to tradition, he is killed in Egypt after the exile. So we've got in tradition, Isaiah, we've got Jeremiah. Now, this next one's not necessarily a prophet, but he is stoned to death in the temple, and that man is Zechariah, and you can read about that in 2 Chronicles 24, 20 through 22. Another prophet that was pursued but not killed was Elijah the prophet, and you can read about how Jezebel pursued him in 1 Kings 19. Now, this next bit, I I know that is speculative. There's individuals that would disagree, but I see it this way. And it's the story of Josiah killing the Kemarim. That's in 2 Kings 23, verses 5 through 20. We read that Josiah or his representatives put down the Kemarim. Now, I know that in the text, they're going to be called idolatrous priests, but there are scholars that look at the Kemarim as Melchizedek priests. And according to my reading of Josiah and his reforms, to me, it falls in line that there was a massive reform and they put down the Kemarim. We've talked about this earlier in other podcasts. You might want to go back and listen to the one on 1 Nephi 1, where we talk about the changes that Josiah makes in the religion of his day, what are called in scholarship the Deuteronomistic reforms. He puts down the Kemarim, and these reforms say things like, God isn't corporeal, God can't be seen, there's no mysteries, there are no temples outside of the place where Yahweh shall choose to put his name. When you put and stack all these traditions together that the text actually tells us, you can read about this in Deuteronomy, you can read about it in 2 Kings 23, And then we read about this large group of priests that are killed. It's provocative to me. It opens up this idea that the Kemarim were the Melchizedek priests that were put down and that Lehi sits in that tradition as an individual who swims upstream from the cultural river of the Deuteronomistic historian that basically changes religion and says you can't see God and that there's only one God, this strict monotheism instead of the father and the son and even the mother and that Lehi sits in that tradition, and that's one of the reasons why the people in Jerusalem want to kill him. Now, the next couple of prophets that are killed are not really mentioned in the Bible, but I think they're important, and they are Zenic and Zenus. Zenic and Zenus are described as being slain for their testimony of the Son, and you can read about them in 
Helaman 8, verse 19, and Alma 33, verses 15 through 17. So there's at least seven prophets who were either killed or almost killed. And now I know we're pulling from a lot of threads. We're pulling from tradition. We're pulling from the Book of Mormon, and we're pulling from some of these outside sources to kind of make the argument. But Jesus knew about these traditions. And by the way, I think the authors of the Gospels, they too are pulling from these traditions, not just the Old Testament. They're quoting the Book of Enoch. They're quoting other their traditions, and they're incorporating them to teach about who Jesus is, that he is the embodiment of the Son of Man. A lot of the apocalyptic texts that are coming out of 2nd century BC Judaism talk about the Son of Man that's going to come and fix things, that's going to initiate the resurrection, that's going to change the world. And these gospel writers are using those ideas And then they're saying and pointing to us to Jesus, and they're saying, this is who this is. He is the Messiah. And so I see Jesus quoting that for a lot of reasons, and I think one of the reasons is because this is foreshadowing his destiny. He's going to be one among these prophets that will be killed. Now, before we leave this chapter and and all the rebuke he gives, count the exclamation marks, count the woes, and all of a sudden you're going to realize that sin doesn't cause the greatest rebukes from Christ. When he's around sinners, he doesn't react this way. There seems to be two things that bring out a stern rebuke from the Messiah, and they seem to be hypocrisy and getting in other people's way, being the reason that other people can't enter the door So how many times in these chapters does he rebuke the hypocrisy? Woe unto you. You're like graves that appear to be clean and beautiful on the outside and inside are made of decaying bodies. Don't be a hypocrite to say I'm one thing and to be another. You want to see the Savior react strongly to a situation? It's almost always hypocrisy. And the other one is getting in someone else's way. Notice he says in verse 51, Woe unto you lawyers, exclamation mark, for ye have taken away the key of knowledge. Ye enter not in yourselves, and them that were entering in, ye hindered. Those seem to be the two things that bring out the sternest rebuke from the Savior. Can I show you that that continues in the book of Revelation? He says, I know thy works. Thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. It's that rebuke of hypocrisy. Let me take you to the Doctrine and Covenants and show you a very stern warning from the Lord. He says in section 112, verses 24 through 26, Vengeance cometh speedily upon the inhabitants of the earth. A day of wrath, a day of burning, a day of desolation, a day of weeping, of mourning and lamentation, as a whirlwind it shall come upon the face of the earth, saith the Lord. Now where will it begin? Where will his most severe desolation come? He says, upon my house shall it begin. And from my house shall it go forth, saith the Lord. First among those among you, saith the Lord who have professed to know my name and have not known me and have blasphemed against me in the midst of my house. Boy, hypocrisy seems to be the one thing he just has the least amount of tolerance for. To say I'm one thing and to be another. You know, Bryce, I think a big part of it too is because they were in a position of power. Yeah. And that position of power combined with hypocrisy is a pretty tough mix. And that's why I think that second one is getting in the way, being the reason that other people can't enter the door. It reminds me of this statement from Joseph F. Smith, the sixth president of the church. He says, I believe in obeying the commandments of God or else get out of the way. We ought not to be stumbling blocks to those who are trying to enter in at the door. God will hold us responsible for this. If there is a man on earth that has done wrong because I have set him the example, 
I am in some measure responsible for that wrong, and I will have to pay the debt in some way. Think about how many times the Book of Mormon talks about the wickedness of the church being a stumbling block. He sure doesn't have that response when he's around sinners. He doesn't respond that way to the woman taken in adultery or to the publicans. But man, does he rebuke hypocrisy and getting in the way. I think it's really important that we see who he's talking to, because sometimes I've read the New Testament and I read the way he talks to the Pharisees and I think, oh, I'm going to make the Lord mad or he's going to be mad at me. And so I really think it's important, like you say, to draw that distinction. This is Richard G. Scott, and he says this, the joyful news for anyone who desires to be rid of the consequences of past poor choices is that the Lord sees weakness differently than he does rebellion. Whereas the Lord warns that unrepented rebellion will bring punishment, when the Lord speaks of our weaknesses, it is always with mercy. That's just a really great quote. And then Elder Scott gives several scriptures to kind of back up what he's talking about, how the Lord views that differently. I think that's really important. So the rest of this podcast is going to be focusing in on Matthew 11 and 12. So the first part of Matthew 11, right up to the first 19 verses, those verses we've discussed earlier with Luke 7, 18 through 35, that's where John sends messengers to Jesus, and then Jesus testifies of his work, and then he sends those people back to John to report back. And so with that, we're going to pick up to Matthew 11, verses 20 through 24. And this is where Jesus says that it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon than for Bethsaida or Capernaum. Verse 20 of Matthew 11, then he began to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. Woe unto thee, Chorazin, woe unto thee, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Tyre and Sidon were cities to the north, and they were pagan cities outside of Israeli influence. But then Jesus says in verse 22, but I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. Now, we need to remember that the bulk of Jesus' miracles are happening in Capernaum. And the city may have had as many as 10,000 people in Jesus' day. Back in 1961, Spencer W. Kimball went on tour of the land, and as he was with his guide, he asked his guide, he said, where is Chorazin? And his guide shook his head and said, there is no Chorazin. We conclude it must have been on one of those hills above where there is grain and vegetables and dry weeds above Galilee. So then President Kimball asked the guide, where is Bethsaida? Our guide shook his head again. There is no Bethsaida. Well, what about Capernaum? Where is that place where there are fish and where Jesus walked? And his guide shook his head again and said, oh, I think I know where you mean. And then he took him to the ruins of a synagogue and showed him the ruins. And then President Kimball basically quotes this passage and says, you know, it would still be here today if they had not rejected Jesus. Now, I like that, but I also see so many early followers coming out of Capernaum. And the city is in ruins right now. You can visit the city and see an old synagogue at about the time of Jesus. And even perhaps, they, they say, they think, uh, according to tradition, you can see like the foundation stones of the house of Peter's mother-in-law there in Capernaum. But there's no city there now. But this is the house where Peter lived. And Peter is a staunch follower of Jesus. This is where Levi had his business as a tax collector. And from my reading of Matthew's narrative, he leaves his business. He literally forsakes everything and is 100% following Jesus. So there are a core group of followers that come out of Capernaum, but it seems to me that as I read Matthew 11, Jesus is calling out those individuals who've seen these miracles, and they're just kind of on the sidelines saying... 
you know what, I'm not going to follow. I'm not going to believe. And it's a difficult passage. It also kind of opens up in my mind the heathen nations, as we read in section 45 of the Doctrine and Covenants, where the Lord says that when he comes again, it will be tolerable for them. And so I kind of read this in the light of where much is given, much is required. And those that don't have the light will not be judged by that light. And I kind of see a space of mercy for God's children who have less light. That's kind of how I read these passages as well. Now, here's an equivalent, Mike, just to kind of throw this in while we're talking about that same idea. Alma says in the wicked city of Ammonai, this is a Nephite city that has gone completely apostate. He talks about the Lamanites don't keep the commandments, and they've been cut off. Nevertheless, I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for them in the day of judgment than for you if you remain in your sins. Yea, and even more tolerable for them in this life than for you, except ye repent. For there are many promises extended to the Lamanites, for it is because of the traditions of their fathers that caused them to remain in their state of ignorance. Therefore the Lord will be merciful unto them and prolong their existence in the land. At some point of time they will be brought to believe in his word. But he's going on to say, but you, you know better. To sin against the light brings a greater condemnation than those who are sinning without that light. Now, we're going to see that among the Amalekites. Remember the most wicked portion of Lamanites that will not be converted by Ammon, Aaron, Omner, and Himni were the Amalekites. And at the very end of Alma chapter 24, he says, and thus we can plainly discern that after a people have been once enlightened by the Spirit of God, and have had great knowledge of things pertaining to righteousness, and then have fallen away into sin and transgression, they become more hardened, and thus their state becomes worse than though they had never known these things. That's why it's going to be better for Tyre and Sidon and for Lamanites than for those who had the light and chose not to follow it. Now, the solution is simple. Follow the light that you have. No matter how much light it is, follow the light that you have. Yeah. And so after his discussion about these cities, if you go to Matthew 11, verse 25, we read as it were a prayer where it says, at that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight, all things are delivered unto me of the Father. And that leads us to some of the most beautiful verses in the New Testament, where Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, which describes me, I know, and I'm guessing most of you. This life is hard. Navigating this life can be very hard. The storm blows against us. And he says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I shall give you rest. Now, I want to talk about that rest. Can I give you an assignment? Will you read President Nelson's recent general conference talk on overcoming the world? The reason we enter into the rest isn't because our burden has suddenly been lightened as much as our strength to carry it has been increased. It's not that the burden goes away. It's that our strength that comes from our covenants have been increased. If you come unto Christ, he will make your burdens light and you enter into his rest because of the strength he gives you. President Nelson said, making and keeping covenants actually makes life easier. Each person who makes covenants in baptismal fonts and in temples and keeps them has increased access to the power of Jesus Christ. Please ponder that stunning truth. The reward for keeping covenants with God is heavenly power, power that strengthens us to withstand our trials, temptations, and heartaches better. This power eases our way. Those who live the higher laws of Jesus Christ have access to his higher power. 
Now listen to the words of a prophet. He then concludes, thus, covenant keepers are entitled to a special kind of rest that comes to them through their covenantal relationship with God. That's the rest he's offering. It's not, I'm going to take your problems away, but I will give you the strength to endure them. That's why they're lightened. That's why they're easier to bear. Let me give you an example from the Book of Mormon. In Mosiah chapter 24, we find Amulon and the Lamanites exercising authority over Alma and his brethren. They began to persecute them and put tasks upon them and put taskmasters over them. Now, that is a heavy, heavy burden. But watch how the Lord makes the burden light, not by taking it away, but by increasing our strength to bear it. Verse 13, Mosiah 24, 13, it came to pass that the voice of the Lord came to them in their affliction, saying, lift up your heads and be of good comfort. For I know of the covenant, see President Nelson, key word, covenant. I know of the covenant which ye have made unto me. And I will covenant with my people to deliver them out of bondage. Now, deliverance is going to come someday, but not today. Today is not the day of deliverance. Today is the day of strength. So he says in verse 14, I will also ease the burdens which are put upon your shoulders, even that you cannot feel them upon your backs, even while you are in bondage. And this will I do that you may stand as witnesses for me hereafter that ye may know of a surety that I, the Lord, do visit my people in their inflictions. Now it came to pass that the burdens which were laid upon Alma and his brethren were made light. Yea, the Lord did strengthen them that they could bear up their burdens with ease. And they did submit cheerfully and with patience to all the will of the Lord. That is what Jesus is referring to. That is the invitation. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and he will give you the strength through your covenants to bear this burden. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I really appreciate that he uses the word yoke here. The only way a yoke works is if I put it on my shoulders and he puts it on his shoulders and we push together. I must yoke myself with Christ. Now, let's be honest. He's going to push a whole lot harder than I am. But you know what? I'm going to give it every ounce of strength that I have. I will yoke myself with Jesus and push with him. And the reason we're going to pull the load is because of his strength. But I have to partner with him. I don't sit on the sidelines and put the yoke on him. He says, take my yoke upon you. Be my partner in this work. Love what I love do what I do, serve the way I serve. And in so doing, I push the load. But my load is going to move because his strength will allow me to move it. That's how we enter into his rest. Excellent. I really like what Elder Maxwell said about that, where he said, there's a really kind of special form of rest that comes from following Jesus I love how he uses the language. He says, we release ourselves of fatiguing insincerity, exhausting hypocrisy, and the strength sapping quest for recognition, praise, and power. And, you know, I think those words are as applicable today as they were when he said them. He said that back in 1997 and how the world has changed, but yet we still live in a world where people are having strength sapping quests for recognition, praise, and power. Very interesting. In the 12th chapter of Matthew, in the first 13 verses, is this conversation about the Sabbath. And Jesus is asked this question 
about, okay, what is acceptable behavior on the Sabbath? And we just need to know that there were many conversations in Jesus's day about the Sabbath and what is acceptable. And frankly, even in Judaism today, there are differences of opinion. And so, and this is a generalization, but in Jesus's day, there were basically two houses that were kind of at odds with each other. And they, they were called Beit Hillel, or the House of Hillel, and Beit Shammai, or the, or the House of Shammai. And these two houses, or these two rabbinical schools, had interpretations that were at odds with one another. And in general, this is not 100%, but in general, the House of Shammai, or Beit Shammai, was more strict. And Beit Hillel, their opinion was more lenient in general of the approaches. And according to some, Beit Hillel's opinions has been accepted today as normative for halakha, or the way, the, the following that most modern Jews follow today. And so there's a couple examples we'll share with you. One of them is the approach of kindling fire on the Sabbath. The house of Hillel allowed for the kindling of fire on the Sabbath, but this was prohibited by Beit Shammai. As they interpreted the Bible, that would be a prohibition of kindling fire on the Sabbath. So they were just more strict on some of these things. There were some that would even say things like, you can't carry a tool on the Sabbath, or if you were a tailor, you couldn't have like a like a needle in your cloak, you're carrying tools. And there were actually even Pharisees that debated whether you should apply medicine on the Sabbath. And, and, you know, they did have these conversations. They were struggling with, and I think what, what we need to look for here is they wanted to do a good thing. They wanted to keep the Sabbath. So what we have here is in chapter 12 of Matthew, verse 10, Jesus is going to heal this guy whose hand is withered. And then he's going to pitch this question to his followers. He's going to say, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? That's the question on the table. And then he said to them in verse 11, what man shall there be among you that has a sheep? And if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? Now that actually happened. They would dig pits to kind of trap wolves and predators And sometimes sheep would fall into these pits. And so Jesus is basically just asking that question. And so here, the way I read this, Jesus is basically saying, listen, um, the Sabbath is for man. The Sabbath is to bless mankind. Yeah. In other words, we don't serve the Sabbath as our master, which sometimes that's how we present it. You can't change your clothes. You got to be dressed up in Sunday clothes and that you have to serve the master, which is the Sabbath. Well, you can't watch TV. And sometimes we portray it that way, that Sabbath is master and we are servant. And Jesus says, no, the Sabbath is your servant. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Use the Sabbath day to accomplish what you need to accomplish to draw closer to God. So many times we, like the Pharisees, turn it into a system of have-tos without seeing the why. So let me make a beautiful little list right now of what Jesus says is appropriate for the Sabbath. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 11, He says, what man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep and he fall into the pit, will not lay hold on it, and, I love this word, ready? Here's my first word, lift. He will lift it out. And that is very, very appropriate Sabbath behavior, anything that lifts. Does it lift me? Does it lift my family? Does it lift my ward? Does it lift my neighbor? I should spend my days on the Sabbath day lifting. And then in the very next verse, he says, how much better than is a man than a sheep? Therefore, wherefore, it is lawful to do well. It is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. Use the day to do well. And one more in Matthew 12, verse 13, he says, stretch forth thine hand to the man. And he stretched it forth and it was restored whole. Boy, that's one of the best descriptions of what the Sabbath is supposed to do. Restore whole. Lift, do well, and restore whole. Let's turn to Mark. 
Mark chapter 1, verse 21 has another beautiful example of what to do on the Sabbath day. They went into the Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day he entered into a synagogue and taught. Teach. The Sabbath day is a day for teaching. In the next chapter, now we've got to go to the JST version because there's a beautiful JST. So Mark 2.26. And we're going to put the JST in the show notes. Has a link to this verse where he says, Wherefore the Sabbath was given unto man for a day of rest. Boy, that's a beautiful word. In all that it means, physical rest, spiritual rest, mental and social rest. Homework rest, maybe. Wherefore the Sabbath was given unto man for a day of rest, and also that man should glorify God, and not that man should not eat. Don't turn the Sabbath into a master that you serve. It's a servant that serves you. For the Son of Man made the Sabbath day, therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Turn to chapter 3. There's another one in Mark chapter 3, verse 4. He says, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil, to save life or to kill? Another beautiful word, the Sabbath should save life. Whatever we do, it should lift and restore whole and allow us to rest and glorify God and save life. A few in Luke Luke chapter 13 has a beautiful illustration. I'm going to start in verse 10. He was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. There's our cue. Now watch what is appropriate for the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed together and could in no way lift herself up. Now, does that describe you or a family member or a child or someone in your ward? Someone who has a spirit of an infirmity and they've had it for a long time and can't lift themselves up? When Jesus saw it, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmities. He laid his hands upon her, and immediately she was made straight. Now the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, How dare you do that on the Sabbath? Because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath and said unto them, There are six days in which men ought to work. In them therefore come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. Do you see the hypocrisy? The Lord answered him and said, Thou hypocrite, doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox? and his ass from the stall, and lead him away to watering? Ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound low these eighteen years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? Whatever you choose to do on the Sabbath day, it should loose from the bonds that we face. It should free us. It should lead us to watering. It should loose us from our infirmities. In the very next chapter, Luke chapter 14, there's one more. Jesus answered and spake unto the lawyers and Pharisees and said, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? Boy, I should do as many things as I can that will heal me, heal my family, Heal my ward, heal people that I love. It is lawful to heal. Just one more on our list. I think you can find many more, but in John chapter 9, verse 14, we see another beautiful example of what to do on the Sabbath day. Verse 13, it says, They brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind, and it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. I love that after that story of the man born blind, John points out that it was the Sabbath day that Jesus opened his eyes. Whatever we do on the Sabbath day, it should lift and heal and cause us to rest. It should free us from a bondage or a burden. It should heal us and open our eyes. Yeah. 
So after the discussion about the Sabbath, the Pharisees in verse 14 of Matthew 12 counsel how they could destroy Jesus. And we read, Jesus knew it, and he withdrew himself from thence, and a great multitude followed him, and he healed them all. And he charged them that they should not make him known, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. Now that's Isaiah. So Matthew's going to quote Isaiah. Now one thing we know about Matthew is he loves to quote the Old Testament, and he does it a lot. So he quotes this passage... And he's quoting, a lot of this is coming to us from Isaiah 42 in the first four verses. So I'm just going to read Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 4. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, and whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry nor lift up nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail nor be discouraged, till he have set judgment in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. The idea of setting judgment in the earth, that mishpat, we're setting fairness in the earth. Now, Matthew is omitting 42.4a where it reads, he will not grow weak or faint, nor be discouraged until he has established mishpat, or fairness upon the earth, or justice upon the earth. Essentially, Matthew is emphasizing that Jesus is the servant spoken of by Isaiah. We see a similar pattern in Abinadi's proclamation to the wicked King Noah in the Book of Mormon. Abinadi is going to cite Isaiah, and he's going to say that Jesus is the servant. My take on why Matthew is omitting Isaiah 42, 4a. My take on this is because I think Matthew is looking back and realizing, hey, I don't think that fairness has been established on the earth. We still live in a time of inequity, as it were, but I do see this as a future fulfillment. I see this as millennial, but right now, hey, things aren't always fair. I mean, just watch the news. We know that not everything's fair. I like the idea where Matthew also quotes Isaiah. If you look in the 12th chapter, verse 20, a bruised reed shall he not break and smoking flax shall he not quench. Now it depends on how you read this and there's, there's differences of opinion here. But one way to read this is that a reed could be used for measuring and for support so that once its straightness was lost by bending it or cracking it, it's of no further use. A strip of linen cloth used as a lamp wick, if it smokes, is of no use giving light. It's simply a source of pollution. It's in danger of going out altogether. So common sense would demand that both be replaced, the reed being snapped and discarded or burned and the wick extinguished. The imagery that's being used here seems to be one that Jesus is willing to encourage the damaged or the vulnerable people among us. That's one way to read this. Giving these individuals a further opportunity to succeed when society denies them their rights. I think that could be read this way. So the servant that Matthew's quoting back in this Isaiah passage is not one who is quick to condemn and discard, but he's one who will persevere until God's purposes of mishpat or judgment has been achieved. I really like that ideal. I see Jesus sitting in that position that he's just, you know, verse 20, he sees the bruised reed that's broken or that's partly not working in the smoking flax. And he's just waiting and giving them an opportunity. And he's doing all that he can to help them to be successful. We're going to see this in other parables that Jesus is going to talk about. We'll see some of these later. Then in Matthew 12, verses 31 through 37, this is where we read that no forgiveness for blasphemy against the Holy Ghost is allowed. Go to verse 31. Jesus says, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Now there's a Joseph Smith translation that really kind of helps shed light on verse 31. Right. 
Here's how it reads with the fullness of the JST put in. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men who receive me and repent. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven unto men. Now, Joseph Smith taught this. All sin shall be forgiven except the sin against the Holy Ghost, for Jesus will save all except the sons of perdition. What must a man do to commit the unpardonable sin? He must receive the Holy Ghost, have the heavens open unto him, and know God, and then sin against him. After a man has sinned against the Holy Ghost, there is no repentance for him. He has got to say the sun does not shine while he sees it. He has got to deny Jesus Christ when the heavens have been opened unto him. And he's got to deny the plan of salvation with his eyes open to the truth of it. And from that time, he begins to be an enemy. Now, this is how I read that comment from Joseph Smith. I see the atonement of Jesus Christ as infinite. And so, because it's infinite, I believe that all sins can be forgiven. On the Savior's side, all sins can be forgiven. Yeah, he has that power. Then for me, the way I see this sin against the Holy Ghost, it is an individual who doesn't want that. The atonement can't be efficacious in my life if I don't want it to be, if I don't want to repent. And so, in other words, I see the Savior with his arms open saying, come unto me, and the degree to which we do and let the light in then we can ascend. But these individuals don't want that. And so if I read it that way, then for me, it holds that the atonement is still infinite, but it also holds that they're in that space of darkness because that is what they want. There's an entire verse that's included in the Joseph Smith translation that we don't even have in Matthew. So let me include that. After verse 42, when the queen of the south shall rise up in judgment, we find this verse in the JST. Then came some of the scribes and said unto him, Master, it is written that every sin shall be forgiven, but ye say, Whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven. And they asked him, saying, How can these things be? So that's the question that leads to this funny little parable about the devil and sweeping in the house. So the question is, how is it that the sin against the Holy Ghost can't be forgiven? The answer is the parable. He said unto them, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. But when a man speaketh against the Holy Ghost, then he saith, I will return to my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth him empty, swept, and garnished, for the good spirit leaveth him unto himself. Then goeth the evil spirit, and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wickedly than himself. And they enter in and dwell there, and the last end of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be unto this wicked generation. So Jesus compares it to a man who kicks out the good spirit. And once you kick out that good spirit, the evil spirit's going to come in, and he's going to grab all of his friends, and they're going to come in. So the idea that he's teaching here is always hold on to the light. Let's turn to the Book of Mormon and see if I can even illustrate that even further. Speaking to Zeezrom in the wicked city of Ammoniah, Alma says to Zeezrom, He that will harden his heart, the same receiveth the lesser portion of the word. And he that will not harden his heart, to him is given the greater portion of the word, until it is given for him to know the mysteries of God, until he know them in full. And they that will harden their hearts, to them is given the lesser portion of the word, until they know nothing concerning his mysteries. And then they are taken captive by the devil and led by his will down to destruction. Now, this is what is meant by the chains of hell. In other words, if I yield to the light that I have, I get more light. And then if I yield to that light, I get more light. But if I refuse that light and don't add to it, I lose light. I can continue that process until I lose all light. That's what Alma says to Zeezrom, that if you harden your hearts, to them is given the lesser portion of the word until they know nothing. Now, if I have no light, if I lose all light, 
can I possibly repent? Will I do the things that I need to do to change if I've lost all light? I think you can, but I don't think you will. I think that's the issue. And that's why I think Alma says at the very end, this is what is meant by the chains of hell. You are chained in hell because you chose to lose light. And now you can't or won't grab onto that light to increase it. The blasphemy against the Holy Ghost is when you continually give up the light until you know nothing concerning the mysteries of God. And when you're in that point, you can't repent. You won't repent. It's not that the Savior can't save you. Yeah, that's kind of how I read it too. It's that you won't grab the light to be saved. There's an intriguing verse in Doctrine and Covenants section 29, speaking of Lucifer. And again, it's not that Jesus can't save them. It's that they won't repent. Doctrine and Covenants section 29 verse 44 says, and they that believe not unto eternal damnation, for they cannot be redeemed from their spiritual fall because they repent not. For they love darkness rather than light. They've kicked out the light from their house, and the evil spirit has taken residence with all of his friends. They love darkness rather than light, and their deeds are evil and they receive their wages of whom they list to obey. That's what happens when we blaspheme against the Holy Ghost. I think that's also good in establishing the idea that the atonement can fix broken things. I think sometimes, you know, I've heard it been taught that the atonement can't fix certain things. It just doesn't ring true to me because the atonement, if it's of God and if it is all the things that the scriptures say it is, it, it can fix all things that are broken. And if it's not, it's not infinite. Right. If it can't fix all things, then it's not infinite. And so many Book of Mormon prophets stand as a testimony that there must needs be an infinite atonement. I think that's what's at stake. I don't think Bryce and I are trying to be nitpickers. I think we're just trying to carve out a space where we can see both ideas in the context of the gospel. And so the final part of our text that we're looking at today is this discussion that Jesus has regarding signs. And that's found in Matthew 12, verses 38 through 45. And so here, the Pharisees come to Jesus and say, we want a sign. And he rebukes them. And this is where it gets confusing. I've had a lot of people ask questions. Well, is it okay to ask for a sign or is it not? Jesus says it's an evil and adulterous generation that seeketh after a sign. And yet, wasn't it Gideon that asked the Lord to put the dew on the fleece? And then, as a second round, well, can you put the dew everywhere else but the fleece? Wasn't Gideon asking for a sign? And so when is it okay and when isn't it okay? And I think the Savior's trying to say here, if you are asking for a sign, thinking the sign will cause you to believe, then you are a wicked and adulterous generation. Signs don't cause people to believe, but signs do have a purpose. Signs can confirm belief. And I think that's what Gideon was doing. Lord, I believe. Now, can you confirm my belief by showing me a sign? That's not a very pessimistic, well, I don't believe and I won't believe until you show me a sign. The scriptures seem to open the door for asking for a confirmation of belief. And that's where I think there's a little bit of wiggle room for people like Gideon in the Old Testament that is asking the Lord to put the dew on the fleece. So let's turn to the Book of Mormon, because I think the Book of Mormon gives us some room for a divine purpose in signs, in God showing signs and may seeking for a sign, because there were signs associated with the birth and death of Christ. And so Samuel the Lamanite, standing on the wall, gives them some divine reasons to look for signs. Let's start in Helaman chapter 14. Notice in verse 2, he says, Behold, I give unto you a sign. God gives signs, and I look for signs to confirm what I believe. In verse 3, he says, I give unto you a sign of his coming. And then he says, I'm going to give you a sign of his death. Now, notice what he says in verse 12. 
And also that ye might know of the coming of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Father of heaven and of earth, the creator of all things from the beginning, and that you might know of the signs of his coming to the intent that you might believe on his name. Now, balance that with what we read in Matthew 12, when Jesus says, it is a wicked generation that asks for a sign. Samuel says, I give this sign to the intent that you might believe on his name. So they confirm belief. How about verse 28 of Helaman chapter 14? And the angel said unto me that many shall see greater things than these to the intent that they might believe that these signs and these wonders should come to pass upon all the face of the land to the intent that there should be no cause for unbelief among the children of men. Then in verse 29, and this to the intent that whosoever will believe might be saved. And whosoever will not believe, a righteous judgment might come upon them. Which suggests a second reason for a sign. God gives signs to leave you without excuse. Now see those kind of balance out. Go to Helaman chapter 15, verse 17. Speaking of the signs of his birth and death, it says, And now behold, saith the Lord, concerning the people of the Nephites, if they will not repent and observe to do my will, I will utterly destroy them, saith the Lord, because of their unbelief, notwithstanding the many mighty works which I have done among them. So what then was the purpose of the many mighty works? It was to confirm their belief. And that was divinely given. I will destroy you if you sin, notwithstanding the many mighty works which I have done among you. Let's just do one more. Turn to Helaman chapter 16, verses 4 and 5. For behold, Nephi was baptizing and prophesying and preaching, crying repentance unto the people, showing signs and wonders, working miracles among the people, that they might know that the Christ must surely come, telling them of things which must surely come that they might know and remember of the time of their coming that they had been made known unto them beforehand, to the intent that they might believe. The Book of Mormon opens a door to saying that signs are given and appropriately can be sought for to confirm a belief I am choosing to believe in. It's an act of faith for me to say, Lord, I believe. But I am seeking a sign to the intent that I might more firmly believe. You know, Bryce, what I think you're doing is opening us up to the idea that there's more going on than just the written words. I think if we were sitting there watching this exchange, the way they're asking him the question would invite us to understand his response. And so by adding some of these other texts, what you're doing is showing us the nuance, as it were. Everything isn't just black and white. Sometimes it's the shades of gray that make the picture come into focus. And context matters, which is why, thank goodness, the Lord gives us multiple scriptures so that we can see how all of this is balanced. And with that, we end this podcast. We'll see you next week when we cover Matthew 13... Luke 8 and Luke 13. The parables. What a great contribution to our gospel knowledge. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Talking Scripture is not an official production of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The opinions expressed in this podcast are Mike and Bryce's opinions only. We refer you to official church sources and the church website to clarify any doctrinal questions.